My name is Ben Wasik. I am one of the elders here at Hope. Uh, if you guys don't recognize me, uh, it's probably because uh, most Sundays our pastors at this downtown location are the ones who typically do the preaching. Uh, but a few times a year, we like to give the pastors uh, a break from preaching. Uh, and so I have the privilege uh, of preaching uh, today. Uh, a little bit more about me. Um, here, I think, there we go. Uh, here's a picture of my family. Uh, you can see my beautiful wife, uh, Becca, uh, and our four kids, Lena, Harper, Silas, and Livy. Just to give you a little bit of a glimpse of what our house looks like with four, uh, four kids uh, and probably shows a little bit about our personality as well. Uh, yesterday morning, we spent a chunk of the morning looking for a lost retainer uh, in our house that we couldn't find. Last night, believe it or not, we looked for another different lost retainer uh, that we couldn't find. And then this morning, uh, I got up, uh, was ready to get in the car to preach and realized that our keys were locked into our vehicle. Uh, and so I quick texted course that I'm going to be a few minutes late, um, was actually in the process of booking an Uber to get to church this morning. And my wife happened to find our spare key uh, kind of the last minute. So I was able to get here. So again, just a little bit of glimpse of uh, what life looks like uh, for our family. Uh, a little bit more about uh, just our involvement at Hope. Uh, Becca and I, we lead a small group here at Hope. We're also small group coaches uh, just personally. Uh, I help lead the financial stewardship uh, ministry uh, here at Hope. And then uh, for work, what I do is um, I'm a financial planner and then also help lead uh, just our, our small financial planning uh, company uh, is what that looks like uh, for work. So that's a little bit of an intro uh, to me. Uh, the sermon series that we're going to be continuing in uh, today, I don't know if this is, am I hitting the right button? There we go. Oops. All right, we'll get this figured out. Here we go. Uh, so the sermon series we're going to continue on is a summer sermon series called The Gospel Mixtape. And the idea behind this is we're taking a look at some of the wisdom and song books from the Old Testament and just taking a look at those and seeing how do we see the gospel uh, in these books or how do we see Jesus uh, displayed in these different books. And so uh, two weeks ago, Core kicked off the series and we went through uh, Psalm 10, uh, and just took a look at how do we see Jesus in Psalm 10. Last week, Pastor Steve, on his 60th birthday, it was fun to celebrate that, uh, he took us through uh, Proverbs 1 and just this idea of biblical wisdom uh, and what that looks like. And today, uh, I will be going through uh, another psalm, Psalm 119, uh, which is a, um, a chapter of the Bible that's really all about God's Word, uh, God's written Word, uh, or uh, the Bible uh, right here. So that's where we're going to be going in a little bit. Um, just to kind of set that up, um, there's a movie called Inside Out. Um, our family has not had the chance to see the new Inside Out yet. There's Inside Out 2 in the theaters right now. Uh, but in Inside Out 1, um, one of the big things I talked about this is a, this idea of these core memories um, that, that people have. And a core memory is really something that it's significant in the time that it happens, but not only is it significant at that time, but it really kind of shapes who you are or it, it you know, um, just develops, you know, who you are in the future uh, as well. And I want to share with you uh, a core memory that I was able to have uh, back in 2011. Um, in 2011, I had the opportunity to travel to a extremely remote island of uh, Indonesia and uh, I was not there, um, you know, on a, a surfing trip. Maybe that's a, a reason that you might go to a remote island of Indonesia. I wasn't there as like a travel blogger or as an influencer. Uh, I don't even know if influencers were a thing back in 2011. Um, but I was there actually to participate or get to, to be a part of a, a Bible dedication uh, in the New Testament for a group of people that had never received God's word uh, in their written language before. About 30 years before we went there, there was a missionary family with Wycliffe Bible translators that moved to this very remote village um, in Indonesia. They first had to learn the language there. Uh, after they learned the language, they had to actually create a written language. There was no written language. They then taught the people there this written language and then finally translated the New Testament uh, into these people's language. And so, again, just an amazing, you know, process. And then it really culminated in this opportunity to present now uh, the Bible to this group of people. Um, 
my aunt and uncle uh, were also missionaries with Wycliffe, and they had invited me and actually my sister Leah Lindstrom, who goes to Hope here, uh, to come along with them on this trip, along with a couple of our cousins. And uh, just want to, yeah, share a few pictures of that. It was just, again, this kind of core memory for me uh, and seeing this group of people receiving God's word in their written lang- or in their own language for the very first time. Uh, so a few pictures uh, that go along with this. This was just a picture kind of before the dedication happened. There was this parade uh, and you can see these people uh, pay, playing these instruments. Here's another picture uh, from the parade. You can kind of see in the middle there, that was the family that had, had moved there 30 years ago and did the translation work. Uh, and you can just, again, see uh, the, the celebration uh, going on here. Uh, this one right here uh, is a picture from the church where they did the dedication. This was by far the, the nicest uh, building that they had in their whole village. This was actually built even before uh, the family came here. This was a group of missionaries had come there even, uh, yeah, 50 years or so, even before that. And they built this uh, structure, which is their church. Uh, and then this was, there were actually two different uh, kind of services. One was in a more uh, populated area. That's where this one was, where the tents are. You can see there I am. Uh, and they're kind of the family that, that I went with um, on the, the right-hand side. That's when I had a little bit more hair before having four kids, uh, as you can see in that picture. And then after the service, uh, this is the Bibles now that are being handed out. They had these vouchers where they could go and they could get uh, a Bible for each person. Uh, and I just love these pictures here, um, them holding up the Bible. Again, just this joy of having God's word uh, in their language for the first time. Uh, and then some of my favorite pictures here, just a father and a you know, son, just again, opening up God's word and reading it together for the first time in their own language. And again, just amazing to me in this you know, kind of humble place. They didn't have uh, electricity. They didn't have running water. They didn't have mattresses to sleep on, but here they are uh, with God's word uh, in their, their language. And so again, just a, a very impactful um, just trip for me, uh, getting to, to be able to experience this. And so the rest of our time uh, together this morning, I want to talk about God's Word. It's going to be in kind of two different parts. So first half, we're going to talk about uh, God's written Word, and that's the Bible. Uh, And then we're going to transition and and talk about God's Word made flesh, uh, which is Jesus, uh, in the second uh, half is where we'll go from there. So um, now we'll take a look at uh, Psalm uh, 119. And I just want to give you a little bit of background on this uh, chapter of the Bible. There's some kind of unique things about this chapter. First of all, uh, the author is unknown. We don't know exactly who wrote this book. Um, Probably most likely David or Ezra or Daniel uh, are most likely the authors of this book, but we don't know for sure uh, who wrote it. Um, Secondly, it's actually the longest chapter in the whole Bible. 176 verses uh, in this uh, chapter of the Bible. Um, and it's actually mo- longer than many books of the Bible. Uh, another unique thing about the book is just how it's carefully structured. Uh, there's actually 22 stanzas in this book that have eight verses in each of those stanzas. And all of the verses in each stanza actually start with the same letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so I, I've got a visual here that just kind of shows a little bit what this looks like. Um, there's a, you can't, it's, it's kind of hard to tell, but there's 176 lines there, each of those broken into groups of eight with each color set aside. And then you've got the corresponding uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet uh, above it. And so, for example, if this was in the, the English alphabet, uh, you would have, you know, the first eight verses would all start with the letter A. Then the second eight verses would all start with the letter B. Uh, and so on and so forth. And so, Again, just you can see the time and attention that was put into writing uh, this psalm uh, by the psalmist. And just a couple of, again, just things that are amazing to me. If I was writing something like this, I feel like a resource that I would probably use would be, you know, chat GPT of just helping me think of, okay, what are some words that start with the letter A, start with the letter B? Um, but I'm pretty sure this was written a few years before chat GPT was available. So amazing that, um, again, the psalmist did this. Uh, And secondly, just came up with a thought, if there's anybody here, uh, maybe you've got children and you started all their names with the first letter. I think you might be able to especially resonate with this psalm uh, that we're going to go through today as well. Um, Then uh, next is um, that this, like I said, this uh, chapter of the Bible is really all about God's word. Um, Of the 176 verses, 
169 of these verses explicitly mention God's word. So again, throughout this whole book, um, really going to see God's word over and over again. And then the last thing I just wanted to share as kind of an introduction to this book is uh, there's many different words that are used to refer to scripture in this book. And so some of the, the key ones that are used are law, testimonies, precepts, statutes, commandments, rules or ordinances, um, just general word, uh, and then promise. And so again, these are many of the different words. And when you see words like this, like for example, law, when you see that you might first think to the Ten Commandments and thinking, okay, that's what the law is representing. And it is true. The law is a word used to describe the Ten Commandments. However, we also see uh, some different uh, points in Scripture um, where, where actually there's, there's two points where Jesus actually says, uh, as it is written in the law, and then he goes on to quote from the Psalms, which would typically not be viewed as the law. And so um, for our purposes today, we want to kind of look at all of these different words when any of, the, any of these words are, are, are used really to represent the Bible as a whole or, or God's word um, as a whole uh, being used to describe that. Um, so now we'll actually um, go ahead and, and kind of get into the chapter. Um, I thought about um, having us all um, stand and, and, and read together the 176 verses, um, but I actually timed it out and it took about 16 minutes and 39 seconds. And I figured if we did that, uh, by the time we got done reading, I'd need to give you guys all a water break to kind of get refreshed and, and resettled. And so we're not going to go through all the, the verses uh, in this psalm today. Um, but I think a better use of our time is to kind of talk about some of the key themes that we see throughout, um, throughout this, uh, this chapter. And so we're going to go through, first of all, you know, kind of four different things that, that we can learn about Scripture, kind of benefits uh, of what Scripture does for us. And then we're going to talk about three kind of ways that the psalmist interacts with Scripture. So the first um, one that we want to talk about is that God's word is trustworthy and righteous. Um, and so, again, these are all from 100, uh, Psalm 119, uh, verse 138 says, the statutes that you have laid down are righteous. They are fully trustworthy. 142 says, your righteousness is everlasting and your law is true. And then verse 160 says, all of your words are true. All of your righteous laws are eternal. Um, and at the bottom, you can see there's that kind of tie or the, the line of all the different verses, all 176. I also just put those arrows there just so you can kind of see, you know, since it's such a long psalm, like where are we at um, in the midst of this psalm? Where are each of these verses coming from? Uh, and so again, this first principle, just being this idea that, that God's word is trustworthy uh, and righteous. And we see in each of these three verses um, that we're highlighting here, um, in all three of them, there's this um, idea of just trustworthiness or, or it being true uh, and righteousness uh, being mentioned. And I think this is really helpful uh, in the world that we you know, live in today where our culture seems to be saying like, there's not absolute truth that, that can be found. Uh, we don't, um, we can't know anything, you know, to be sure, uh, to be true for sure. Uh, but what we're seeing here is that as Christians, we don't believe that. We actually believe that there is absolute truth and that that absolute truth uh, can be found in, in God's word. Um, so yeah, I just think that's also assuring that, you know, thinking over, you know, thousands and thousands of years and, and many different cultures and even thinking, again, to this remote village in Indonesia and thinking to where, you know, we live today, that in both of those places, God's word re remains relevant and helpful uh, as, as we're making decisions, as we're going uh, about our lives, uh, as we're seeking for, seeking truth. And so, again, that's that first principle uh, of just God's word is trustworthy and righteous. Uh, the second one that I want to talk about is that God's word provides freedom. Uh, verse 32 says, I run in the path of your commands, for you have broadened my understanding. And then verse 45, I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought your precepts. Uh, and so uh, in this one, it, it might seem counterintuitive at first. And just this idea that how can, you know, rules and commands and laws that encourage a specific way of living actually result in freedom? Uh, at first thought, you might say like that, that seems really restrictive to have to follow uh, this certain path uh, or follow these certain rules, um, you know, that are, are laid out for us. But I think that the reason that this freedom um, is described here is that, like we talked about, if we know what truth is, we don't 
have to be searching all of these other places to be looking for, you know, where truth is or to find purpose uh, or meaning in life. Uh, we don't have to, yeah, figure out, you know, where does our salvation come from? Like scripture tells us where that comes from. And I think it provides freedom. Uh, I think one example is, let's say that you're, you know, mountain biking and you're going, you know, down this mountain and this trail and going pretty fast. If the, the path is well marked out for you and you know where to go, like there's a freedom associated with that. You can go faster. You know where you're going. There's a contentment in knowing that. Whereas if you don't know where that path is, there's a lot less freedom. You, you can't go nearly as, as fast because you don't know where that next turn is going to be or, or where you're going to be headed. Uh, and so again, just an amazing gift that the word of God uh, provides freedom to us. The third one that we're going to take a look at is God's word provides guidance. Uh, so in verse 105, it says, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Uh, verse 130, the unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And then verse 132, direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Um, just one thing I want to point out, first of all, about um, verse 105 there. That's a probably maybe one of the, the well, most well-known um, verse in all of Psalm 119. But one thing just, you know, cool uh, as getting ready for this sermon is this idea of the, the lamp to my feet is really described as kind of a lantern or something that's helping you see maybe just a few steps ahead of you. You can't, you know, see very far. Uh, whereas the light onto my path is more of like a floodlight type of light that's just really illuminating everything. You think about, you know, the creation of the world and let there be light. That's the type of light that's be describing, being described there. And so just... I think it's pretty amazing just thinking about God's word, both being a personal kind of light that we can use, but also this light that just illuminates uh, everything uh, at the same time as well. And um, I think just this idea of God's word providing guidance, uh, I think is just really helpful, especially uh, in our world today. If you think, I think there's more decisions, more big decisions that we have to make today than um, at any ever, you know, really point in, in history. Uh, if you think, Three or four generations ago, uh, most people, uh, when they looked at, you know, where they were going to live, it's just they lived wherever they grew up. They didn't, people didn't travel very far. If you think about their jobs, most people just did whatever their uh, parents did for work. That's probably what they were going to be doing uh, for work at that point. Um, you think about, you know, who they might marry. It's probably going to be just a, a small group of people or maybe even in some cases there were arranged marriages at that point. So a lot of those big decisions, you know, didn't have to be made Whereas today, um, there are all kinds of decisions, you know, that need to be made. Um, you know, today we can uh, live anywhere really in the world that we want. It's kind of all open to us. As far as jobs go, we can kind of work uh, anywhere that we want. I was actually just talking to Ben at the beginning of the service and with remote work, it's like we can live wherever or we can live wherever we want and potentially still do the same job. Um, just as far as, you know, who, who are we going to spend our time with? Well, what is our friend group going to look like? Um, will I get married? And if so, like, whom am I going to get married to? Uh, decisions just like where to send kids to school uh, is a big decision. Uh, where to serve? Which TV series to watch? Uh, which NFL team to cheer for? Uh, that one's actually pretty easy. The Packers is the only right answer there. But um, <laughs> All right. But for all those... For all those other ones, again, these are big decisions that have to be made. And I think it just does bring great peace uh, just knowing that really, again, the Word of God, the Bible does speak to these things. It does give us guidance uh, in these big decisions that we're having to make uh, in life. Uh, and then the last one I wanted to highlight is that God's Word provides comfort. Uh, verse 114 says, You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your Word. Uh, verse 147, I will rise before dawn and cry for help. I have put my hope in your word. And then verse 161, uh, rulers um, persecute me without cause, but my heart trembles at your word. So knowing God's word, um, it, it doesn't mean that life won't be hard. Uh, it, it will be hard, but um, knowing his word and his promises does bring great hope uh, in times of trouble. Uh, or in times of need. So now we've looked at, again, kind of first, these four kind of benefits of Scripture, things that we can get through God's Word. And this is not an exhaustive list. There's certainly many other uh, benefits uh, that we can get from Scripture, but these are just four as I was going through 
um, Psalm 119 in preparation for this that, that stood out to me. Uh, but now I want to take some time just to talk a little bit more about the relationship between the psalmist and, um, and, and God's word. And so the next one we're going to look at is God's word is to be delighted in. Uh, verse 14 says, I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. Uh, verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And then verse 162, I rejoice in your promises like one who finds great spoil. Uh, so yeah, I just, looking at these, just want to really view God's word as a gift. If we think back uh, to the people of Indonesia from the beginning of my speech, when they, uh, when they got God's word for the first time, um, it was something that they delighted in. It wasn't something that was a burden to them or something that they had to do this list of rules. It was something that it was a gift and they wanted to celebrate that. They wanted to study it. Um, they wanted to learn more about it. Um, another example from scripture uh, that I want to give, um, I'll be bringing it on the screen in a, in a second of, of why we see that, that scripture really is a gift to us, is um, found in a book. So for those of you who have been at Hope for a while, uh, three weeks ago, we finished our series on Romans. Uh, and so we kind of said at that point, it was a two-year study. We, we got to the end of it. You know, we're done with it. Then the very week after that, um, in Pastor Kaur's sermon, he quoted uh, a passage from Romans. So can, keeping the streak going. Last year, Pastor Steve uh, preached, preached, on Roman, or preached on a whole book, but, uh, or on, on uh, Proverbs 1, but brought up a, a, a verse from Romans again. And today, I just, I'm not ready to give up the streak yet. We can't get away from Romans. And so we do have another uh, verse from Romans that we're going to take a look at uh, today. And this is from Romans 1, uh, 19 through 20. Uh, it says, uh, Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has, been, has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what was made, uh, what has been made, so that people are without excuse. And so what we see here is that this is saying that just throughout creation, uh, even without God's word, we can know who God is. Um, we can know his divine nature. Uh, we, we can know these things. And so it's saying like God's word is not needed to know God. And yet, God gives us this whole book right here, this Bible. And I think it, again, it's just this incredible gift, this incredible, uh, yeah, gift of generosity and of grace that God has given us that we can uh, have his word. Uh, we are able to study it, to know him better, uh, to know where we uh, fit into the narrative and what our identity is uh, because of that. And so again, just God's word is something uh, to, to be delighted in. Uh, the next one, there's only one verse from this, but I just thought this was a, an important uh, thing that I see with the, the psalmist relationship with scripture. So I wanted to add this as well. Uh, this is from verse 11. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And um, it seems here what the psalmist is describing is just the idea of like memorizing portions of scripture so that when things do get hard, that he can bring these things up and remember, uh, yeah, just God's truths. Uh, and if you first read this, it, it might seem like he's saying, if I memorize scripture that I won't sin anymore. Uh, we, we do know that that's not what this is saying if we look at all of scripture, but really I think a tool that we can use to help to fight against sin in our lives. Um, several years ago, I had the chance to go through restoration groups here at Hope, and, and one of the primary tools that we talked about uh, for fighting against sin is just this idea of truth statements or remembering God's truths or, or scripture to help us um, just to remember, again, the majesty of God, uh, and as we see that, just the less attractive, you know, sin really becomes uh, to us. And then the last one uh, I wanted to share is that God's word is to be interacted with. I've got four verses here. Uh, verse 20 says, My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. Uh, verse 62, At midnight I rise to give thanks for your righteous laws. 97, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. And verse 164, seven times a day, I praise you for your righteous laws. By this point in the sermon, you, know, you might be, you know, thinking to yourself, you know, I struggle to read God's word once every seven days, let alone seven times a day. Or you might be thinking, you know, I really do 
like reading God's word, but I'm not setting an alarm at midnight to wake up and read it some more. Uh, or, you know, thinking like, you know, I've been a Christian for a long time and I have a high view of scripture, but I, I don't really think about it as being sweeter than honey or to be pursued more than riches. And, you know, you might ask the question, you know, is there something wrong with me because of these things? And uh, I think in one sense, the answer is actually, yes, there is something wrong with you and that you can never perfectly live out the law. You can never live up to this standard. And the good news is that you don't have to. Um, we're going to talk about this in the second part of the, the, the sermon today. Um, but there is somebody who did live the law, you know, perfectly uh, so that we don't have to. Um, with that said, there do seem to be, uh, or actually, sorry, one more thing I wanted to say in this too is, I also think as we're going through this psalm, that the main point of this psalm um, is not to look at the psalmist and say, wow, look at the relationship or look at how good the psalmist is, but rather to think about how good God is and how good his word is. Uh, and in other words, to, we don't want to praise the psalmist here. Uh, we want to be praising uh, God. Um, and so, again, even though we can never um, perfectly live uh, out, uh, again, all of these laws, I do think that the psalmist makes it really clear that there are some great benefits uh, to Scripture. Uh, just, again, we talked about just uh, truth and freedom and guidance uh, and comfort. And so those are some great benefits that we get. And so you might just, yeah, be asking the question of like, sometimes the, the Bible can feel overwhelming of like, how do I actually get into it? How do I get into a more regular practice of it? And so I do just want to take a, some, a few minutes just to talk about a few practical things that I have found in my own life to be really helpful uh, in studying uh, the Word of God. And so the first one is uh, Hope's uh, All Church Reading Plan. This is just a great thing. If you're not sure, like, where do I get started? I, I want to read the Bible, not sure where to go. Uh, this is something, if you go on Hope's uh, resource page, you can uh, download this document. You could actually print it out, put it in your Bible. Um, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, there's basically a psalm, uh, a gospel, and then some other reading that you can just go ahead and read through that and knowing that there's a bunch of other people uh, at Hope who are reading that same thing at the same time. There's also an option on that same website where if you enter in your email address, you can actually have um, these verses emailed directly to your email address every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And so if you're just in the habit of checking email, um, just makes things a little bit easier where now you can, can pull that up uh, and just take some time uh, to read uh, God's word. Um, another resource is uh, the Bible app has some reading plans. This is something I was introduced to a couple of years ago. Um, and with a group of guys for the last, yeah, two years or so, uh, we've been going through different reading plans. Um, some really, um, I guess just, first of all, there's over 10,000 different reading plans you can choose from. Some last just a couple of days, uh, some last for over a year. And there's, you know, studies on different books of the Bible. Um, there's studies on different topics. Um, but it's just a, a really cool thing to study the Word of God in community. And the way that it kind of works is every day there's a short, usually devotional uh, that goes with it. You study, you, it brings up some different passages of scripture. And then there's an opportunity to respond and actually to kind of type in like, where did you see Jesus in the text today? Or what did God teach you through what you read that day? And anybody who's in that group with you, who you invite to this, they can all see that. And so it's just been an amazing way uh, to study uh, God's word uh, with a group of guys the last couple of years. And I think that it not only provides some accountability, but even the bigger benefit is just Again, seeing what stood out to other people uh, as you're interacting uh, with Scripture that way. Um, another thing I want to share is the Bible Recap podcast. Um, I'm guessing that there's a number of people who are familiar with that. Uh, and the reason for that is it's amazing. Uh, earlier this year, this was actually the most downloaded podcast uh, in the whole United States. Uh, and so, again, it, it gained, gained a lot of popularity. Uh, this is something that the group of guys that we're doing the reading plan with, this is something we started out for the first time this year. I'd never heard about it before. One of the guys suggested it, but uh, Tara Lee Cobble is the person, uh, the woman who does the podcast. And uh, yeah, I've just been so blessed by, by what she does every day. It's about an eight minute podcast. Or uh, if you guys are like me and listen to podcasts at two times speed, it's about four minutes a day. Uh, that you get to, to listen to it. And she just does an amazing job of summarizing. Uh, so it's a read through the Bible in a year plan. And she does a great job of summarizing what was read that day uh, and then kind of how it ties to the larger biblical narrative. Uh, and then uh, after that, she does 
just my favorite part is every day she does what she calls a God shot, where basically how did we see Jesus in what we read today? Or how do we learn more about God's character uh, from what we learned about today? And especially we just got done going through uh, the books of First and Second Kings, which there's so many, again, different kind of stories going on, different kings. You've got the North and the South Kingdom. And it just, yeah, can get confusing. And it's really helpful um, just to kind of, again, summarize and, and look at that bigger picture of, of what's actually going on uh, in the story at this time. And how do we see God working uh, amidst uh, what's going on here. So anyways, that's been another great, great resource. I encourage you to check out. Uh, if you're wanting to memorize scripture, um, the navigators, um, I don't know if any navigators in the room, but Pastor Steve was a navigator and worked with navigators uh, early on uh, in his, uh, right out of uh, college. Um, I, um, yeah, so navigators kind of, one of the things they're known for is this scripture memorization. And so if you're wanting to memorize uh, different Bible verses, and, and don't know where to get started. This is one way that you can do this. Um, shortly after I graduated from college, somebody introduced this to me, uh, and I memorized about 80 different verses uh, at that time, I think. And it's just a great tool to learn some of the key passages that I think are really helpful uh, to be thinking on uh, in different situations. And so again, just one other tool uh, that can be used. And then I don't have a slide for these things, but just that hope. I think getting involved in a small group. Uh, small groups at Hope are usually studying different books of the Bible. And so just a great opportunity in community to be studying God's word. Uh, And then many different classes that are offered by Hope. Uh, Some of them that you could take Old and New Testament uh, classes, the biblical theology class. We have studies on Romans and and the Mark study. Uh, And so again, just lots of opportunities um, to engage with God's word uh, and to learn more. Um, All right, so now jumping back to Psalm 119, Um, at this point, you might have a pretty high view of the psalmist. Again, just talking about how he interacts uh, with scripture, uh, talking about how it's used. And and you might think that the psalm is going to end something like, wow, like I thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for allowing it to bring me so close to you so I can have this deep relationship, you know, with you. But actually, uh, what I love about this psalm is that it it ends kind of just the opposite of that. Uh, Psalm uh, the very last psalm uh, of the, the very last verse of this psalm is 176. It says, I have strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your commands. So even though the author seems to be following God's word very closely, it's still clear to hear that there's this divide or this distance between him and God. He describes himself as a lost sheep. Uh, needing to be saved. And the one that he's needing uh, is the one who did follow the law perfectly. Um, And that person um, is Jesus. And so that brings us to kind of the second part of what we're going to be going uh, through today. And uh, we're going to go to the New Testament now to John 1. And we've been looking at the written word up to this point. And now we're going to look at the word made flesh. And so in this passage from John 1, uh, we're going to see the word Word, uh, we're going to see the word, word, used a few different times. uh, And that word is referring to Jesus. And so I'll go ahead and read this. It says, in the beginning was the word, or was Jesus. And Jesus, or the word, was God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The word became flesh. And then this is a few verses later in verse 14. It says, the word became flesh or Jesus uh, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Um, Tim Keller actually has a a sermon um, on this relationship between the written word, and the word made flesh. And so I think he does a great job of describing this. So I'm just going to go ahead and and bring up uh, on the screen what he has to say. He says, God has perfectly expressed himself in two ways. God's word as text is perfect, but God's word as text wasn't sufficient to completely express who he is to the world. Not only God's word has to come in the form of text, but God's word must also come in the form of flesh. The word made text can't save you by itself. Every prophet, every priest, every king is pointing to Jesus. You read the temple and the sacrifices, but the ultimate sacrifice is Jesus. You read about the kings and the prophets. The ultimate king and the ultimate prophet is Jesus. 
The word made text is about the word made flesh. And when you see that the word made text and don't, or when you see the word made text and don't realize that it's all about Jesus, then it would be legalism to obey it and would crush you because you'd never live up to it. But when you realize that the word made text is actually about the word made flesh, then you suddenly realize that everything in the Bible is really about him and what he's done to serve, to save you. So yeah, I just, yeah, love this quote uh, from Keller. I think it, it's so helpful because, you know, while the verses that we looked at in Psalm 119 are certainly very helpful, we see them in a whole new light when we see that the word made text is actually describing Jesus, uh, who is to come. Uh, and so I want to give you a few examples of, of kind of what that, um, you know, looks like for us. So first of all, if we think about, again, back to Psalm 119, kind of four conclusions that we had with the verse are that God's word is trustworthy and righteous. It provides freedom provides guidance, and it provides count, uh, comfort. And so because Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of the word, we know that Jesus is those things. Uh, he brings truth and righteousness. Uh, he is the one who, uh, yeah, who, who brings freedom. He's the one who brings guidance. Uh, he's the one who provides com- comfort to us. Uh, and then we also know that he can be delighted in, um, that we can store him in our hearts and that we can interact with him. Uh, another example uh, that I want to give um, is if we go back to uh, a psalm that we studied, uh, Psalm 119, 130. It says, the unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. So here we see, again, the written word of God is bringing us light and giving us understanding. It's helping to guide us. But now we can substitute Jesus uh, in this example and see that the unfolding of Jesus gives light. He gives understanding to the simple. Uh, and so if we look at just, we read in John, you know, one, um, kind of this unfolding now of Jesus uh, coming onto the scene, uh, being waited for for, some long, for so long. And now Jesus is the one who is bringing light to us and providing us with understanding. And it even takes it a step further though uh, in John. If you look at verse five, actually, it says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And so this light that's being described in, in the Psalm is saying that, Again, it's giving us this light to give us further understanding. But we see now uh, in John 1 that it goes far beyond this. This light uh, that's being produced by the word or by Jesus is overcoming uh, the darkness. Almost like bringing things from like black and white in the Old Testament to like this, this new color that you can see the world in. Uh, it's just, yeah, kind of an amazing uh, transformation there. Uh, another example um, what we see here is, so this is a slide that we looked at earlier. And it's amazing that we can actually see Jesus in each of these uh, examples of the word bringing comfort. In Psalm 114, it says that you are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. Uh, This reminds me of when Jesus was tempted uh, in the wilderness for 40 days, Satan tempts him three times. And all three times, uh, Jesus looks to scripture. Uh, to kind of fight against these lies that, that Satan is telling him. Uh, he knows that scripture is truth and it, it's acting as his refuge or his shield. Uh, in verse 147, it says, I rise before dawn and cry for help. Um, we see throughout the gospels, Jesus waking up before anybody else and going to spend time alone uh, with God, uh, his father. Um, and then in 100, verse 161, rulers persecute me without cause. There, again, we see Jesus He was persecuted uh, without cause. And so it's just, yeah, kind of amazing to me that, again, through these examples and throughout the Psalms, we're just able to see examples of Jesus really, again, being the perfect fulfillment uh, of the word of God. And, uh, you know, even to the sake of of following the law perfectly, uh, even to the sake of death. And and one other verse that I did want to share with you Uh, just to kind of set the stage, is that Jesus is in the garden praying uh, shortly before he's persecuted. And then Judas uh, brings basically the crowd to him and he's going to take them over to kind of start this journey uh, to the cross. And uh, in Matthew 26, um, we see it says, with that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword. We know that companion is Peter. Uh, He drew it out and he struck the servant of the high priest, cutting cutting off his ear. And it says, Jesus says, uh, put your sword back in its place for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think that I cannot call on my father and he will at 
uh, he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. And now listen to this last verse, verse 54. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Um, And so again, this is just amazing that again, Jesus has scripture in mind. He he, he is the one who perfectly uh, fulfills scripture. And again, even to the point, uh, you know, he could have called on the legions of angels uh, to be saved. He knew that was the, 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 something he could do, but he was the one who perfectly fulfilled the law, every last part of it uh, for us. And so when, um, yeah, so I would just say, um, yes, it is great for us to indulge God's written word. We should delight in it. We should study it. We should memorize it. But know that no matter how much effort we put into it, we will never be able to perfectly follow the law. Uh, But the good news is that we don't need to because Jesus did live the law perfectly and then he died the death that we deserved uh, so that we might live. And so just uh, in closing, I I wanted to share one other kind of quote that, um, yeah, I think is a good summary of this. It's from the Jesus Storybook Bible, which is our family's favorite children's Bible. Uh, It's at the beginning of the Bible. And I think that the author, uh, Sally Lloyd-Jones, just does a great job of kind of, again, summarizing a lot of what we've talked about today uh, as far as what the role uh, of uh, God's word is. It says, Now some people think that the Bible is a book of rules, telling you that you sh- what you should and shouldn't do. The Bible certainly does have some rules in it. They show you how life works best, but the Bible isn't mainly about you and what you should be doing. It's about God and what he has done. There are lots of stories in the Bible, but all the stories are telling one big story. The story of how God loves his children and comes to rescue them. It takes the whole story uh, it takes, sorry, it takes the whole story of the Bible to tell this story. And at the center of the story, there is a baby. Every story in the Bible whispers his name. He is like a missing piece of the puzzle, the piece that makes all the other pieces fit together. And suddenly you can see a beautiful picture. Uh, so in closing, um, just want to share or ask two questions that you can kind of reflect on uh, as you're leaving today or during this time of communion we'll be entering in soon. Uh, The first one is, do you view God's written word as a burden or as a gift that can be studied to better understand God and the love that he has for you? And the second question is, have you surrendered your life to the only one who perfectly lived out the law and died uh, on the cross uh, so that you could be saved? Um, So with that, we are going to um, move into a time of communion which represents the body and the blood uh, of Jesus Christ uh, who died for our sins. Um, And I'd also like to go ahead and uh, invite the worship team uh, up at this point as well. Uh, Yeah, communion uh, is for anyone who is a follower of Jesus. Uh, At Hope, we practice something called open communion, which means that you don't have to be a member of Hope uh, or any church at all uh, in order to take communion. But we uh, do ask that you're a follower of Jesus. Uh, And for those of you who aren't a follower of Jesus, you know, why not? You could choose today to submit your life uh, to Jesus uh, right here and come take uh, communion for your first time. There will also be people down front uh, who will pray for you uh, during this time. And then finally, right up front here, uh, we have a a gluten-free option for those who need it. And then there's also tables in the back corners and the lower level uh, and on on the top. Uh, Let me go ahead and pray for us. Heavenly Father, uh, you are so generous. Uh, we praise you for giving you for giving us the gift of your written word that allows us to better know who you are and the incredible story of how you redeemed your people. We also praise you for sending your word in the flesh, Jesus, to perfectly live out the law and then to die on the cross for our sins so that we can be saved. We humbly come to you the table this morning, acknowledging that it is only because of your sacrifice and grace that we can be called your children and live in harmony with you. Amen.